official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home Official members bounce Bust off the chrome Realize it's real hell where we call home From the heart inside one I vision fat licks and mat clips The chrome will make the average imitator do backflips You lack a pistol So put a vest around the issue Sluts will never miss you Coming from members that's official I sort of say this every year man. Like, man, It's almost November It should not be 75 degrees um, but it is what it is. Go register to vote outside. I can't vote this year, but if you can, please go register. Okay. Um, administrative stuff. Project two, again, is due, uh, this coming up this Sunday. Who here has not started project two? Excellent. Fantastic. Okay. So of course, the people that are in the lecture probably haven't started. All right. So we having our Saturday office hours, um, again, this Saturday, the day before it's due between three and five, we'll announce this on, on, on Piazza. It'll be in, in the same location. Any questions, comments, or concerns about project two? Yeah, you, yes. <laughs> but again, we gave you guys the test for that reason, that like we gave you all the tests for everything ahead of, ahead of time, uh, so you can debug locally. All right, homework two will be out this Wednesday, and that'll be due in two weeks on November 3rd. And then the midterm exam grades, uh, almost all of them are graded. Few few people had to take take out the makeup makeup exam on the weekend. Uh, so those who need to get graded, and hopefully we'll post those on Piazza tomorrow. Okay. And then I think the mid semester grades are due Wednesday ish, but that's on me, not you guys. All right. Uh, the other things that are that are happening uh, again, we have a lot more speakers this uh, this semester now that fall break is over. Uh, so today we have Spice.ai. There is a Spice DB. That's different from these guys. These are Spice AI, okay? Uh, and so they're basically using DuckDB, Data Fusion, I think SQLite, and everything all at once doing AI, right? So we'll, we'll figure out what that means. And then the Exxon guy is coming to give it a talk. That'll be on Zoom next week. Uh, let's see whether he changes the, the name of the system by then. And then Sonata is a streaming system, and they'll be also using Data Fusion, and they'll be giving a talk in three weeks, okay? Again, these are all optional. All right, so. Right before the fall break and, and the midterm, we were discussing joins, right? And then prior to that, we talked about how, how to do sorts, how to do uh, aggregations, right? These are the, the fundamental building blocks of, of, the, of the operators you would need to have in a relational database system. So now the question is, okay, so I know how to implement individual operators. How do I put this all together and run a real query? And that's what today and next class will be all about. So today, we're going to be talking about what is, how you actually want to build the system to define uh, or have specify how we're going to move data between these operators, uh, when we actually want to execute queries, what does the output look like, how do we handle insert, update, and deletes, right? So when, when a database system, a relational database system is given a SQL query, it's going to convert it into a, a query plan. And ideally, you want this query plan to be a directed acyclic graph, a DAG. Most systems implement, implement them as trees. We can discuss a little bit as we go along why DAGs are preferable. But basically, if it's a tree, you can't reuse output very easily without doing some trickery. Right? But for simplicity, say we're doing join here, uh, join an RNS, right? The, the query plan tree is going to look roughly like this. At the leaf nodes, we, we're doing the scans in RNS. And then the R feeds into the, uh, the build side of this join. Uh, assuming we're doing a hash join, it actually doesn't matter. The S feeds into the filter operator, does the join, and then produces the output. We do, we do a projection. Right? So this, again, this is the logical plan. I didn't specify, you know, I, I said, oh, it's probably a hash join, but it doesn't matter. Like, RNS doesn't, is not specifying how, what algorithm we're using to access this data. And that's what sort of today's class and next class will be about. What are these operator implementations we're actually going to do, and how they're going to move data between the operators. And then next week, we'll, pick, we'll talk about query optimization and how do we decide of the choices we would have for different operator implementations, which, which one we actually want to use. All right, so this is pretty easy to understand, right? It's sort of data is flowing uh, logically, because we'll describe physically how we do it in a second. But data is flowing logically from the scan on R into the join, or scan on S into the filter operator. But now we can define boundaries within this logical plan called pipelines. And a pipeline is going to be a sequence of operators where the, the data can move continuously from one operator to the next without having to block or wait for more data to, to be processed. So what do I mean by that? So in this, say we have this first pipeline here on R. I can scan R and assume it encompasses the, say, this is, again, the hash join, the build side. 
I can scan R and feed into the build side of, of the join here. But then at that point, the pipeline is done, right? Because I can't do anything else for all the data I just came, that just came out of R, because now I've got to do the probe. I've got to do the, join, the, the, the probe side of the join. So the pipeline breaker is essentially the boundary, the endpoint says, I can't continue up with this, any tuple in this pipeline until I run something else in my query plan, another, another pipeline. So in pipeline two, assuming again, we, we execute pipeline one first, we do the scan on R, and now any tuple coming at, sorry, scan on S, any tuple coming out of S, we can ride all the way up to the top to produce our output, right? Assuming we've already run pipeline one. So I scan a tuple on S, I do my filter, I do my probe into my, my join, say the join predicate gets satisfied, the tuple keeps going up, then I do my projection, and then it's outputted. Right? Again, the idea of a pipeline is basically that it's, it's the, the boundary which we can execute a, a bunch of operators uh, without having to go materialize them into intermediate storage, like have potentially a buffer that we have to sp spill to disk. And then a pipeline breaker is going to be anything where we can't keep continuing until we, uh, or we can't execute anything else until we get more, uh, until we get all the tuples uh, below us. Right? This would be obviously if we're joined on the build side. If we take subqueries, nested queries, that we don't decorrelate them correctly, where we've got to execute the entire sub, uh, nested query, then we, that's a pipeline, then we execute another pipeline. Or like an order by clause is kind of obvious. I can't produce any output of an order by operator, ignoring, or even, even heap scan, you can't do this. Yeah, you can't produce any output of a, of a order by operator, sorting operator, until you sort everything, because you don't know what the ranking, the ordering is going to be. Right, so this is the high level model that we're going to work with. And then the question we're talking about today is, what are these lines? Right? I'm saying they're logical because they're saying logical, logically data goes from R into the join, but what are we actually sending? And who's actually invoking us to send it? So that's what today's lecture is about, to execute these queries. So we're first talk about how to do processing models. Again, this would be just how the, so we're going to execute these queries and move data from one operator to the next. Then we'll talk about the access methods. We've already discussed these in some ways, like how to do index scans and so forth, but that's the, the lower portions of the, of the query plan where data is coming out of, of base tables, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Then we'll talk about how to, how to handle queries that modify the database, and then finish up with talk about how we actually evaluate the predicates in our where clauses and our join clauses. Like A equals 1, how are we actually going to execute that? Okay? All right. So a processing model defines how a database system is going to execute a query plan and how it's going to move data from one operator to the next. And just like before, when we talked about row stores versus column stores, there's going to be trade-offs in our system design that will be preferable for a OTP workloads, a row store, essentially, and preferable for a column store, right, and an analytical workload. And then as we define our processing model within our system, we're going to have two mechanisms to, to uh, I'm going to use the control because there's a control flow, but there's basically two mechanisms for how the data system is going to coordinate the execution of these operators and producing output or output tuples, and then where it's going to go. So you're going to have the control flow is the mechanism for how the data system is going to say, okay, you're the op you're the next operator I want to run. Go ahead and run. And produce your output. Or it, could be, or it could be a pipeline or a series of operators. And then the data flow is going to be where and how the operator is going to send its results. And we'll see in one case in the iterator model, they're actually going to uh, blur the lines between the two of these. Because the way they're going to say, all right, I have enough data, stop it running me, is the same way, you know, tell it to stop running at all. Right? And as we see as we go along, the output of an operator will depend on what processing model we want to use. And it could be either the, the entire tuple, it could be the subset of the tuples, right, if it's com store, and it can be one tuple, all the tuples, or some of the tuples. And like I said, there's, and there's trade-offs for, for all of these. So the three approaches are going to be the iterator model, the materialization model, and vectorized model. And the high-level idea is that the iterator model is the most common one. It's what, what people implemented when they first started building data systems, and just going to be moving tuples one at a time. And then the materialization model will be all the tuples come out of an operator, and then the vectorized batch model is sort of a hybrid between the two of them. And so the way to think about them is the, the most of the data systems that you know about, right, the Postgres, the MySQLs, the Oracles, the DB2s, all those, the Mongos, most of them are going to be using the iterator model to send one tuple at a time. Uh, the materialization model is, is very rare. There's probably five systems in the world that I know of that do it. And then the 
The vectorized model is more common in the last 10 years because this is what all the OLAP systems are going to do. Right, this is what your snowflakes and, and your Databricks and so forth are going to do. Okay? All right, so go, we'll talk about the advantages and, and disadvantages of each of these one by one. Um, and then there's a second design decision we'll talk about afterwards. Is like, are we moving the data from the top to the bottom or from the bottom to the top? But that's orthogonal to uh, the processing model right now. We'll, we'll cover that afterwards. All right, so the iterator model is the most basic one. And again, this is the most common implementation that, that uh, most, especially in row store systems, that, that they're going to use. And so each operator in your query plan is going to ha have to find this or implement this API that, that is provided uh, from the system that's going to have basically three functions. There's a next function that says, all right, give me the next tuple uh, that, that, you, that the operator produces the next tuple that's supposed to be part of the output. Uh, of the data that's processing. And the idea is that the parent's going to keep calling next over and over and over again on their child, child operator. I right, keep getting more in tuples. And then at some point, the child operator says, OK, I don't have any more tuples for you. And it sends back a, a null pointer or end of file marker to say, OK, there's no more tuples for you from, coming from me. Never call me. Come call next on me again. All right? And then what's going to happen is, because we just have this sort of simplistic API of just calling next, now we can compose these operators uh, together such that if I'm some operator and I have a child, I don't care how that child is actually producing data. I just know that I've got to call next on it. So I don't care whether it's coming from over the network or uh, coming from an index or coming from a sequential scan on a local file, or it's actually a subquery. Right? It doesn't matter. I can, inter I can intermix these operators, uh, and, and, and everything just sort of works together nicely. There's some extra metadata we can maintain about the state of, 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 our, of, a, of an operator. So we have to have open and, and closed functions. Right? So think of like when you call open uh, on an index scan operator, that's like creating the, the iterator for your, your B plus tree, that you instantiate the iterator, you move it, produce one tuple, and then when you call next again, you just move the iterator over by one and get the next tuple. Right? And then when, when, when you reach the end of the, of the scan, uh, you ret return back and a file. And then the close function will, you can go ahead and clean up the iterator, right? So as I said, this approach is used in most data systems. You'll see these sometimes called uh, the volcano model, because there was a guy, uh, the guy who wrote that book on the B plus tree that we talked about before. He had a very famous paper on a query optimizer and a processing model called the volcano model, where he described how to do this, uh, to extend the iterator model to do parallel queries. We'll see that next class. Um, or it's also something as the pipeline model, because again, the idea within you, you call next uh, going down in a pipeline and just you know, ride, the tuple rise all the way up to the top. Right? All right, so look at the high level diagram. Uh, so we have a simple join on RNS, and then we have, we have our predicate uh, on s.value greater than 100. So I normally don't like to show code, uh, but I think this is pretty simple for you guys to understand. So you can think of like each operator implementation is going to be essentially a for loop over some data source that they're getting from. So the bottom guy on the scan, scan in R, right, it's getting every single tuple in R. But the ones up above, they're, they're getting tuples from their, from their children. So you can think of the, all these functions, like these are like the next calls that all the operators are going to evoke uh, uh, on each other. So when I start off, right, you start at the root of the query plan. And so you have this first query plan up here. And it's, you call it some, some, you know, the, the data system calls next on this function. And inside that, we see we have a for loop. Where we're going to get every single tuple from, the, its, from its child, the next function from its child. So this will be a blocking call. So when this, the first guy at the top calls child.next, there's a blocking call that then jumps down to the, the operator below it. And its next function implementation says, OK, well, now I want to start scanning data to start producing output to my parent. Well, the first thing it has to do is go build the hash table, because this is going to be doing a hash join. So again, so the first thing we do is we do a scan uh, for every single tuple on the left child called dot next, right? And then as this thing gets evoked down here, then it jumps down here. And then now we do the scan on R. And then for every single tuple in R, we call emit. It's almost like a yield function if you've written like a Python iterator. Uh, and then the data goes up uh, as a single tuple, goes up to the, the parent and the join operator, who then inserts it into the hash table. And then it loops back around and calls next again on its child and Get until you know keeps going to get all the tuples, and then at some point it's done. So I don't have any more tuples for you, and doesn't evoke it anymore because now the hash table has been built. 
Then now we drop down to the, uh, to, to the right side of the join. And again, this is still from one call and next from the root, root node. One call and next says, okay, I can't emit any tuples from you until I first build my, 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 my hash table. So I got to go iterate on, on R until you run out of tuples here. Then I'm now going to come down the other side. It calls get next on, on the, the filter operator, which calls get next on, the, on, its, on its child, which is the scan on, on S. And it keeps producing tuples up on my one, which then bubbles up if they pass the filter up to the, the, the join operator. And then now I can do a probe in my hash table. And then if that there's a match, then I produce a tuple at the top up there. Pretty straightforward, right? So again, thinking in terms of in terms of pipelines, pipeline number one is the scan on R. And I'm a really easy way to show this, but like it's the and the, the build side of the join. So it's this operator here to scan R. And then the first port part of the, of the join operator when I build a hash table, right? And again, the pipeline breaker is that I can't, I can't produce any output for my child up above because I still have to go on, the, on, the, on the, the right side and call the right child. Question? For each call to next at the second level, uh, why is it that we go and loop through the entire table R? And, and here? here? Yeah. So the question is, if you're going back here, why, why do I have to go call left.next to get every single tuple in R before I get it on the right side? Uh, like, for each call to next, we're looping through the entire table of R. No, no, yeah, sorry. It, it, think of this like as a, this is an iterator. Like, an, like so I call get next, and then, it, and then when I call emit, there's like a, it's a, I'm returning control. But when I call next again, I'm picking up where I left off, okay. right? I don't want to show like it's, again. It's pseudocode. I wasn't trying to show that. But yeah, it's it's for one get next. I only get one tuple. Yep. But now again, the the I'm trying to think. There are there are any situations where you would, you could do that. But like the, the the thing up above, the parent doesn't need to know what how this thing's actually implemented. So for say for some reason, it did have to scan everything all over again. It's still only going to produce one tuple. Uh, but that's you know the the thing up above doesn't know doesn't doesn't care. Also, which, which could happen, which we'll see in, in a second in the, in the materialization model, but like, if I really wanted to, say somehow like scanning R is really expensive to keep sort of doing it like piecemeal, so I could just scan all of all R, produce some, some buffers, uh, intermediate results, and then every single time I call get next on this, it produces one from that buffer. But again, up above, I don't know whether that happened or not. I don't care. Okay. So as I said, this, this approach is pretty much used in almost every single data system that's out there. It's the easiest thing to implement. This is what BusTub uses. Uh, it's easy to debug because you just walk through the code uh, and see all the function calls and, and, and then see how you know, things, things break. Um, and again, speaking from experience and speaking from students working on BusTub for years. Another nice advantage of this is that the, the output control is really easy with this approach because if I have a limit clause up, up above, like give me the last, give me the top ten tuples, or the, the, give me ten, only ten tuples. The way I, I implement that is I just stop calling get next after I got ten things. All right. So this is what I was saying, where like the control flow and the data flow uh, logic or paths are sort of inter intermixed. Right. There isn't a way to say, hey, go stop. Like going back here, I don't have an easy way. If this thing is scanning, I don't have an easy way for someone else to come in and say, hey, stop scanning, kill this query, or stop, stop what you're doing. Right, because the, the you've already the stack has gone down uh, and you've recursed into the query plan, and it's doing whatever it wants to do, and you have to have sort of a side channel method to kill it. Uh, one question. Yes. Could you go back one slide? Yes. Uh, why are there two pipelines instead of one? Question: Why are there two pipelines instead of one? Yeah. Uh, so again, I scan R. Again, think of like the build side of this as, as part of the first pipeline. I scan R, build the hash join, right? Build the hash table for the join. I can't produce any tuples as the output until I build that hash table, right? Because what would happen if, I, if, if this thing was running and then I've, I have 1,000 tuples, but I've inserted 100 of them, and I keep trying to put the rest in, and then I start running this guy over here, now when I do a probe in that hash table, I may end up with a false negative because the tuple that I would match just hasn't been inserted yet. So, so the data system knows that the dependencies between the pipelines and say, okay, this first pipeline can run, and second pipeline cannot run until this one finishes. 
Okay. And like I said, pretty much every single data system you can think of, uh, for the most part, anything that's a row store will be doing something like this. All right, the alternative model is the materialization model. And this is, there is still a sort of a next function, but it really is like, give me everything. So instead of producing one tuple, uh, anytime you invoke down the operator, you get all the tuples from that operator. And then at which point you never go back and ask it for more data because you have everything that you could ever, ever possibly need, right? And again, you, would, you, would, you could have it produce either a single, uh, sorry, the, all the tuples, or sorry, all the attributes or the columns for, for the tuple or a subset of them. Obviously, if I have a one, you know, one petabyte table, uh, I want to try to push down as much as I can into the scan operator because I don't want to be passing along one, one petabyte of data when maybe I only need a small portion of it. So this is a, um, this, this technique was developed in the 1990s out of this uh, project called MonetDB. Uh, I think I might have mentioned MonetDB before. Um, came out of the, the CWI school in Amsterdam. Um, and, and the first version of DuckDB was actually an embedded version of MonetDB. Uh, ver yeah, the first version of DuckDB was called MonetDB Lite because it was like an embedded version of MoneyDB. They threw all the code away and then rewrote it based on what the, the Germans do. Um, but it's, it's, from, it's from the same school. All right, so again, I don't want to show code, but because I have to. So now instead of having a, so a single next function uh, and producing like a, through an iterated model where you emit tuples output as, as output, now there's a return clause that says, okay, here's my output buffer, add all the tuples that I'm going to need for this operator into that output buffer, and then I return it back. So just like before, I can start from the bottom. The, you know, the root calls child.output, calls down to here. Again, now we're doing a hash join. I got to call left.output that jumps down to here. Now this scan operator can produce all the tuples from R into this buffer. That gets passed up into the here. And then now I can build my hash table. And then I come down on this side of the, of, of the, the query plan or the pipeline uh, and then do the same thing. Scan S, produce the output, pass it into this operator, and then pass it up to that operator. Do you think it's a good idea or a bad idea? I've sort of said before, why is it a bad idea? I mean, just take this example right here, right? So what am I doing? I'm taking all the tuples in S, adding to an output buffer, and then now passing to this operator who's just going to scan through it and apply the predicate. Again, always think of the streams. I have a, say I have a billion tuples, but I, my predicate's only going to match two of them. That sucks, right? Because I just passed a billion tuples to only you know, throw away 99.9% .9 of them. So a really simple optimization you can do in, the, in this world is what's called operator fusion, where the idea is basically inline or combine different operators uh, that, that are within the same pipeline where you know that you don't need to have that sort of excess copying. So in this case here, it's just scanning the, the output of this guy and then applying the predicate. Well, I can just do that all, all together once, right? Scan R, then apply the predicate if it matches you put them put them into my output output buffer. So you can do this for projections. You can do this for uh, uh, filters. Uh, not not not. You can't do it for everything. Um, you can do it for limits if you know you don't have an order by up above, right? And then just like before, the pipeline breaker would be I can't can't you know keep writing tuples up. Um, I really really do pipeline. Wouldn't do pipeline in a materialization model, but you know I can't can't produce any output of this operator here until I, I first build build my hash table and then do the probe on the join. So MonetDB started off as an OLAP system. Uh, it was originally designed as an OLAP system, and it was one of the first column store systems. Um, and it was meant to be idea of like processing entire arrays of 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 of. of of, of entire columns, of tuples. Um, and that's sort of why they thought it would be good to have this materialization model. It's only really useful in the OLTP world um, because in that world, the queries are only accessing a small number of tuples at a time. So yeah, you're going to materialize the entire output of the, of, of the, of the operator all at once. But if you do that, then you never have to go back and get more data. So if you call, like think of the get next in the iterator model, I say I want my operator to produce one tuple. I call get next, it gives me one tuple. I call get next again, then it comes back and says, okay, end of file, right? Those function calls actually add up, especially if your database is in memory 
and your queries are really, really fast. Because right? it's a jump call in, 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 in the CPU. So if you now, if you have sort of designed the, like an array, like I know I gotta, this thing's gonna call this, this is gonna call this, and you actually don't even have any indirection to figure out what, what needs to call what, you just kind of rip through that array and just call these operators, produce their output, and pass it one between the other, and it's much faster. And, but you can only really do this for OTP, um, because you know, the output coming out of one operator is gonna be small. So this is actually what we implemented in, in HStore over 15 years ago, which then got put into the commercial version of OltDB. Um, and then CrateDB is out of Europe. RavenDB is a document store based on, um, similar to similar like MongoDB. These systems use it, uh, but MongoDB and HiRise, MongoDB and HiRise were, were the OLAP systems trying to do this. MongoDB still does it. HiRise got rid of it and switched to the, the next thing we'll talk on the, the next slide. So again, good for OTP, bad for OLAP. But we kind of we need something in, in between, right? We know that if we're, for OLAP, it's certainly going to call get next is going to be expensive because I have to get, scan a billion tuples. I don't, I don't want to call get next a million times. But then I don't want to materialize everything all at once because, again, I want to be able to break things up and paralyze it and not worry about you know, using up all my memory, just produce the intermediate output of, a, of, a, of an operator. So the obvious fix is do something in between. It seems obvious now, but again, this, this has only existed since 2006, 2007. Because um, people are either doing the materialization model or the, or the iterator model. So the vectorization model is, is basically like the, the iterator model, but instead when you call get next, instead of getting one tuple, you get a batch of tuples. Right? Think of like something like 1024, like a thousand, thousand tuples or something like that. And then the now you're giving it back a batch of tuples, and now the, the operator that got that batch of tuples will, will process on them, uh, on that entire batch, before it goes back and gets the next one, or pr produces the output up above, right? So we'll see this in a second. There's a bunch of tricks you can do now, because you know you're processing on a, a batch of tuples that you couldn't really do easily if it was a single tuple. Again, ignoring, you can do all these tricks, again, if, it's, if, it's, if you have all the tuples, then it becomes almost too big. Like, for example, if you know that all of the tuples for, you know, for a given attribute within a column are coming back with the exact same value, like, you know, integer ID equals 1, then instead of storing that entire vector of 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 over again, you can have a constant vector that says, I, it's like run length encoding, I have the value 1 a thousand times. Now the thing you're passing around is super small. Like, DuckDB does this underneath the covers. When you're running queries, it tries to figure out, do I, do I have constant values? And reuses them. You can compress the, the data as it comes across, like do, doing dozen coding and other things that we talked about before. Because now you have a, a column of data, a columnar data. Right? So going back to our example four, again, this is with these, this it, sort of like the iterator model, but instead of now passing a single tuple, we're passing back a vector. So just like before, we call get next, go down the, the, this side of the pipeline, right? And then now we have an output buffer that we're filling up. And then when our output buffer exceeds uh, some size, then we produce it as an output. I'm not showing extra code you need to have outside the for loop. If you have, like, the, uh, the buffer wasn't completely full since the last time you iterated, right, you send whatever remaining mount you have goes up as well. Again, so this sends back a tuple batch, and everything just works just like before. Pretty straightforward? All right, so as I said, this thing has only existed since 2006, 2007. Um, the original paper was, was a project called, at, in, based on MoneyDB, called MoneyDB X100. They tried using MoneyDB to, do, to run on modern CPUs, and they, they realized here's all the parts that are super slow, and one of them was the materialization model. So they, they forked the code uh, and built a, a sort of a high-performance system that's based on the vectorization model. Like nowadays, it sucks because if you say, if you, if you go like vectorization model or vectorization database, you're going to find all the vector DB stuff. Uh, you may also find a bunch of SIMD stuff, which we'll, we'll talk about next class. Uh, and that's completely independent of this. Right? This is just saying, I'm passing back, uh, you know, when I call my operator, I'm, they're getting back a vector of tuples or a batch of tuples. So, as I said, every, pretty much every OLAP system that, that has come out in the last 15 years, even the old ones, have been retrofitted to now follow, follow this approach. Right, because the advantages, especially on, on modern CPUs, are pretty significant. Because now you have these kernels that are iterating uh, over batches of tuples and the same thing over and over again, and that's exactly what modern CPUs want. 
right? They don't like indirection. They don't like doing, you know, some running these instructions and these other instructions and these other instructions. If you say, here's a, here's a stride of memory of data, do the exact same thing a thousand times, CPUs love that. That's the best thing to get, get, get you know, get, that you'll get the best performance because of this, right? So again, if you're building an OLAP system today, you pretty much want to use this, this approach. All right, so again, we talked about the three processing models, iterator model, materialization model, vectorization model. If you're building a, a, a row store system, you want to use the iterator model. If you're using a, an OLAP system, you want the vectorization model. Materialization model, again, it's, 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 it's pretty rare. If you really care about performance in LTP, you could do something like that. So in all my examples that I showed just now, uh, we, we, the way the query was actually executed is that we start at the root of the query plan, and we call get next on the root, which then percolated down called get next on its children. Right? And the, essentially what we're doing in that world is we're starting from the top, and we're pulling data up from the leaves to, to the top to produce our, our output. This is how most database systems are going to be implemented, but it's not the only way. So that approach would be called the, the, the pull approach, the, the pull direction, All right, top to bottom. Again, we always start with the root, and you pull data up from, from its children. Right? The alternative is to start at the bottom, the leaf nodes of the query plan, have them execute, and then push data up to the parents. Right? Conceptually, they're, they're sort of the same, but the, the, when you start doing, uh, when you start fusing in the operators that we talked about before, you can do some crazy tricks and be very, very efficient if you know you're doing a push page model where you're not going to be calling get next on something else. Because right? again, that's indirection in the CPU. And in some systems, in the case of Hyper, uh, I should also put Umbra here. Umbra is the other one. The, the Cedar DB does this as well. But not only are they trying to keep data in CPU caches, they're trying to keep data in CPU registers. The fastest memory you can have, and I know I said we weren't going to talk about low-level hardware below, you know, CPU caches, but they can get insane performance because now for one tuple I can write it up a pipeline as far as I can and just sit in CPU registers, uh, and that's going to be the fastest memory you can have to execute things. So let me show you what the push-based model looks like. So, all right, we're going to have two pipelines just like before, and so in the first pipeline here, it just looks like what we had before, where now we're going to scan R. But instead of calling emit or producing some output that we then pass to another operator, right, it's just going to scan R and build the hash table. It's just this for loop here. Then now in the second pipeline, now we're going to do that fusion we saw before. We're going to scan S and immediately evaluate the predicate. And then if it does, put the hash table and then emit it if it does. It's part of our projection. So the thing now is going to be different than the push-based model and the pull-based model is now we don't have this get next thing that's tickling the operators and telling them, OK, it's your turn to run, produce me some output. We now need a sort of coordinator or schedule that sits above all this, which then now makes explicit invocations to these operators to say, OK, it's your turn to run. Right? Go ahead and go. This thing runs to uh, completion. And then it's going to be no, it's, it's sort of be set up ahead of time, because that's part of the query plan we would generate. It's going to know, OK, the hash table it's generating is going to go at some location in, in memory, in the buffer pool or, or, or whatever. And then now, once this thing is completed, it says, the is, OK, well, I know pipeline one is done. Now it's time to book pipeline two. And it's already baked in, or you're passing in. Here's where the intermediate results of the hash table you cared about that was created by the first pipeline. Here's where to go find it. Now it can, can just run to completion, produce this output like that. Again, so you can do this sort of operator fusion in, in the different models. Uh, and I'm not really showing here, you know, in this case here, it's, it's, it's a, it's, you know, the for loop is operating on a single tuple, but it could be operating on a vector of tuples, right? You can, enter, you can, you can mix and match these different processing models and the, the processing direction uh, based, on, uh, you know, based on what the, the workload you're trying to support. So the top to bottom approach, like I said, is the most common one. Uh, it's easy to control the, the, the output. Uh, like how many tuples you want, because you just tell it, okay, stop calling next, right? And you don't need any explicit mechanisms in the operators themselves to say, okay, you, I've got enough data, stop. The parents are, you know, they keep calling get next. That's going to have an overhead, of course, because, you know, especially if you implement this in C++, 
when, when now you got it, you know, you basically have an operator uh, interface, and then you have to look up the virtual function table in C++ to say, okay, what actually implementation do I have? Um, and then, as we said before, the CPU cost of this can be actually kind of high. Now, again, if you have to go to spill out a disk and read something disk, who cares about your, your branch call, your jump call, and your CPU? But if you, in a well-tuned system, you try to keep as much memory as you can, you know, this can start to matter a lot. The bottom to the top approach, the push approach, is, is rare. Uh, but you can have really tight control of where data is actually being placed, again, in caches, in, reg in registers. Um, you do need to have additional mechanisms to say, okay, I got enough data, stop running. Uh, like you basically have to embed somehow in, the, in those sort of nested for loops that I showed before, a way to say, okay, I've got enough, I gotta got quit. Whereas you don't have to have that explicit control in, in the, the pool model. So I'm saying this is rare. DuckDB actually originally started off as being a pool brooch. Uh, and then they decided to switch over to this. And one of the things that they highlight is having the ability to uh, have a separate control flow, control mechanism for these operators made engineering the system actually a lot easier. Snowflake follows this approach as well. Uh, but the, like I said, the, I didn't mention this before, the, the MoneyDB project I mentioned before that like where they, they developed the vectorization model those two researchers then went off and built a commercial system called VectorWise. That got bought by Actian, and, and, which is sort of a holding company for, for database, old databases, but eventually got killed off. But then Marcin, the guy that developed the vectorization model, he then went and became a co-founder of Snowflake. So the guy that invented the vectorization model also founded Snowflake. And a lot of the ideas that he developed on that earlier MoneyDB system is what Snowflake is based on today. So that's kind of cool. All right, so any questions about processing models or processing directions? Yes? Can you explain in more detail the first bullet point under approach to uh, tighter control of caches? Yeah, the question, the question is, what do I mean here, tighter control of CPU caches and registers and pipelines? So going back here, um, we're not going to talk about this right, we're not going to talk about this semester, but like in some systems, you can actually just in time compile the code for this. Because now you're just, you're just nesting a bunch of for loops, and you can have really tight control of like, okay, how big should my batch be? Okay, well, I know my CPU has this amount of CPU cache, or maybe this, this amount of registers, like, so I can decide at what increment do I want uh, you know, to iterate over the, in the for loops. So I can decide, okay, I want to keep everything in CPU registers, so therefore only look at a single tuple, and then now I can control when I call these things that it's more likely going to sit in CPU registers and not you know, L1 or L2. Whereas as soon as you have a next call, I mean, that's all over. Because that's a jump in, in the CPU instructions. OK. All right, now we're going to talk about access methods. Um, again, the access methods are basically the, the, the leaf nodes of the query plan. Again, this is independent of whether we're doing you know, iterator versus vectorization, or push versus pull. At the end of the day, we got to get data out of our tables that people have put data in, right? And there's only really three ways to do it. You do a sequential scan, which is the brute force approach of just reading every single page until you find either what you're looking for or all the tuples. You can do index scan, and there's a lot of different variations of this based on whether it's a hash table, a B plus tree, a try, or whatever data structure you have. Um, and then the third approach, you could do a, a multi-index scan. You kind of mix and match, you have a bunch of indexes. Instead of just picking one, pick a bunch of them, and then combine their results. All right? We'll see that in a second. All right? And then depending on, on, the, on the sequential scan, if, you know, if it's clustered or non-clustered data, you can make various optimization choices based on that. All right, so sequential scan. This is like the default choice. If I have no indexes, or no index is going to help my query, it's it's the most basic thing you can do. And it's, you know, it's, it's probably what you want to implement first when you build a new data system because it's, just prove, it's a way to prove whether you got the, you know, you're storing the data you expect to be in there. Right? And so it's a really basic loop. For every single page in my, in my table, go retrieve it from the buffer pool using the page ID. Right? You use the page directory or whatever the mechanism to go get that, get, get that data. Uh, if it's an LSM, you got to basically look at everything. Uh, or just look at what the most, you have the way to figure out what are the, 
Yeah, L uh, select star without a where clause in LSM, you have to you have to basically look at everything because you don't know whether there's something in a lower SS table that you haven't seen before, right? That isn't in an upper level, and you gotta make sure you, that you catch it. So again, this is a game where LSMs will be actually worse for this. But assuming we're doing uh, honored heaps, get get every page for every single group on the page, evaluate some predicate, and then and then do something. And then in our operator, as I said before, it's basically like an iterator in. Uh, the scan operator, it'll be like an iterator in Python where I keep track of my cursor or what's the last page I looked at and the last slot I looked at so that when I call get next or however I'm, I'm producing tuples as part of the, the, the scan operator, I know how to continue along where I left off last time. So if you think, okay, well, this is the most brain dead thing you can do in the data system. It's basically reading every single page. Is there any way to speed it up? Let me take a guess. In many of my ideas, how to, how, to make, how to make a scratch scan go faster. What's that? Parallelize it. You said. Was it vectorization? Sure. Preload pages. Preload pages. Excellent. All right. Three. All right. Perfect. We've already discussed a lot of these. Parallelization and vectorization are new, but we already talked about preloading, prefetching. All right? So we think, again, this is like the, the worst thing you can do in the data system, but we've already discussed a bunch of ways to actually make this go faster. Right? We talked about how to compress the data so that when I go fetch a page, I get more tuples than I would if it was uncompressed. We talked about prefetching or scan sharing or buffer pool bypass. If I'm squinching, you know, I don't want to pollute my, my buffer pool with data I know I'm not going to need right away. Task parallelization and multi threading uh, and data parallelization and vectorization, we'll discuss that in next class. Clustering and sorting, we've already talked about that. Right? Depending on what my where clause is, maybe I want to sort of the data first, and then look at over the sorted data. Late materialization we talked about, right? Just pass around the record ID if it's a, if it's a column store uh, in my query plans and only go back to the get back the data that I eventually need, right? Data skipping we'll talk about next. Uh, we're not going to talk about materialized view and result caching in this, this class, but just think of like result caching is obvious. S select star from data from select star from table where, where ID equals Andy. If I see the same query over and over again, rather than just running it, I just have a cache and says, oh yeah, you want you know, ID equals Andy, here's the result. Materialized view is a bit more complicated. You can have a more complex query uh, that you, you, you then store as an intermediate result, and queries can then maybe execute, get sub-portions sub or subsets out of, out of that result cache, rather than blindly returning back the, the old the result. Now, of course, then, this is tricky, because how do I keep these things in sync with the actual, ta the actual table? We'll, we'll discuss a little bit of that uh, when we talk about courage control. Code specialization compilation, we'll, we won't talk about this too much this semester, but I'll talk about a little bit about compilation at the end of this class. It's a way of basically saying, instead of having giant switch calls and say, if my operator is this, do that, or if my data type is this, do that, I basically want to JIT or pre-compile a bunch of stuff ahead of time so that since I know what the data is going to look like because it's a relational data database and I've been told the schema, I can say, okay, I know exactly what this column looks like. I know how to run this predicate you're trying to run. Here's the exact function I pre-compiled that does what you want, and it, it'll run really fast. All right, we won't, again, these don't want to discuss too much, but I, I want to talk about data skipping. So the idea of data skipping is sort of, sort of like an index, almost like a, or like a filter, basically saying, does the thing I want actually exist? And the basic idea is that it's a way to say, I know that there's some subset of a table that I'm trying to scan right now that I don't need for my query because I look at the where clause, I look at the predicates and say, uh, you know, this is what I'm actually looking for. And if I have some pre-computed data about, the, about the, my tables, I can make a decision. I know there's certain pages or blocks I don't need to read. So there's basically two approaches. There's lossy versus lossless. Similarly, we talk about lossy compression versus lossless compression, right? Lossy compression or uh, data skipping we won't talk about, but the idea here is that if I know my query doesn't need to see exact results, then I don't scan every single page. I'll just sample the pages. And then I could have some kind of statistical confidence to say how accurate is, is my, my request. So in a lot of systems, they'll have, um, especially in the cloud system, the OLAP systems, they'll, you know, they'll have the standard aggregation functions that we talked about before, count, min, max, average. But then they'll have approximate versions of those, like count approximate. I think it's called an oracle. So that'll be, OK, well, I'm just going to get a subset of the data and compute your average on that. And that's probably good enough for you, depending on the needs of the application. 
right? If you want to say how many people visit my website in a single day, you know, if it's 999 million versus 998 million, if I'm off that much, do I really care? Probably not. So there's a lot of different application domains where you, you, you're okay with approximate results. But the data system won't do this explicitly for you. Sorry, you're implicitly for you. You have to tell it, I really want this thing to be approximate. And then some systems can give you bounds of things. Right? It, it, can, it can get pretty complicated. The thing we're talking about instead is actually zone maps. And basically, this, this is just pre-computed information that says, uh, here's what the data looks like at a high level inside a given pages or a set of pages. And then you can decide whether you actually want to go look at it or not. And you can have really fine-grained zone maps within like a single page, or you can have uh, more coarse-grained zone maps for a large number of pages. And obviously, the, the larger it is, the less selective uh, you may actually be. You may end up having to look at more data than you actually wanted. So pretty much every single data system now supports, or at least in OLAP side, supports some notion of zone maps. All right, so let's say we have a really simple table with one column with five values, right? So our zone map would be pre-computed aggregations that we had before, min, max, average, sum, count. And then say this is, this is one page, has this data, all my other pages would have similar zone maps. And then now when my query comes along, select star from table where value equals value greater than 600. So even before I look at the, the, the pages for the data, I'll look at the zone map and say, okay, well, I'm looking for values where greater than 600, but I know my max value for this column is 400, so I'll never find a match in this column, so therefore I can just skip this, reading this entire page. And again, think on a larger scale, I'm showing five tuples. If I had 1,000 tuples or a billion tuples, right, then that's a huge win of skipping all that data. So the open source file formats that we talked about before, Parquet and Orc, they support this out of the box. Uh, and then pretty much all the column store systems will, will generate uh, something that looks like this. I'm using the term zone maps. That is what Oracle calls them. I'm sure it's copyrighted, whatever. Like, but that's the sort of the, the canonical term everyone uses. Like a, the same way Kleenex is a face tissue. Like you just say Kleenex, everyone knows what you mean. So you say zone map, it's the, it is the Oracle term, but everyone knows what you mean. The original paper calls them small, uh, small materialized aggregations. And materialized, again, means that like, I'm pre-computed, that I'm storing that pre-computed result. So I'm not computing on the fly, and then I can use that from one query to the next. All right, so that's sequential scans. Like I said, there's a bunch of optimization we could do. Some of them we've already covered. Some of them we'll, we'll cover in the future, uh, in, in the next class. Now the other choice, again, is, is it going to be an index scan. So the idea here is that the, the, we, the, the applications created indexes on, on our table that we're trying to access. And then a query shows up. And at runtime, the data system has to figure out, OK, what's the best index I, I could use for this particular query? And there's a bunch of different choices the system can make, like, does it have the, does the index contain the attributes that, that are in our query? Right? Is, is the, the predicate going to be very selective if he uses the query? Or am I still going to have to end up doing a complete leaf node scan? Right? Is it a unique index or non-unique non -unique index? So there's a bunch of different choices the system is going to make to decide what's the best index I want to use to execute an index scan. That's not this class. That's next week when we talk about query optimization. Right? We're still sort of dealing with high-level things at the logical level, although we're talking about physical scans now. But how to decide what's the best index or my choice of indexes to use is going to depend on a bunch of different factors. And this will, we'll sort this out next, next class. But let's look at a simple example here. Suppose we have a single table with 100 tuples, and we have two indexes on, on this table. We have one, one on the age, one on the department. Right? And so in scenario one, there's 99 people under the age of 30, but only two people in the CS department. Right, for this given query. Because the query is trying to find everybody uh, that's under the age of 30, that's in CS, uh, and is, is you know, in school in the US. Right, so now, the other choice would be there's 99 people in the CS department, but only two, two of them are under the age of 30. Again, we have to decide which index we want to use. Because we have both of them. Obviously, in this one, the index on departments would be better for us, because there's only two people in the CS department. So if I use that index, I'm going to get those two tuples very, very quickly. Whereas if I, if I use age, then I'm basically doing a leaf node scan, and then I still got to go look up the tuples to see whether they, they're going to match on, on the age or not. In this case, the scenario is the better index is on, uh, sorry, this one, two people in the CS one. Yeah, this one better is better index on age because I'm only looking up, again, I'm, I'm just going to find the two people instead of doing the complete scan. Right, so in this choice, is pretty obvious which we want to use. 
but then the other situations where both of them look pretty good. And so I actually want to use both of them for my query. And this is called a multi-index scan. Um, I think Oracle calls them, I think multi-index scans, Postgres calls them bitmap scans because they generate bitmaps and, and then union them or, or uh, take an intersection, which I'll show next, next slide. MySQL calls these index merges. But all, the high level, they're basically doing the same thing, that we're going to use, do, mul do, do multiple scans on our indexes, get back the record IDs of the matching tuples, and then do the, either a union or intersection based on whether it's an AND clause or an OR clause in my WHERE clause, to then figure out, okay, what are the matching record IDs? Then go, go fetch them. And now you see again why we make a big deal about having this, uh, this sort of generic API for our operators so that we can compose them in, in, in any different ways and not worry about, you know, one parent has to worry about how the, 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 the child operator is actually producing data. Because now when I call get next, I'm doing the iterator model with this approach, I'm actually going to do the index probes first, get the record sets, then do the union, and then now walk through and find the, the tuples that I want. So I did a bunch of work on the first, uh, the first next call. And then now any subsequent call will just be reusing those cache results from the, from the intersection or, or the union I computed. All right, so let's see what it looks like. So again, so say we have the same query here. Both of them, the indexes look pretty reasonable. So we're going to first retrieve the record IDs on age less than 30 using index number one. Then we're going to get it, and then we're going to now do the lookup on the second index for department equals CS. Take the intersection of, of the two results of, of, the, of, the, of the two indexes, then go fetch those tuples to see whether they actually satisfy the last predicate where country equals US. My hand waving here probably doesn't help, so let's look, actually look at an example. Right? So again, I first can do the lookup on the age, get the record IDs, then look up on CS department. Now the intersection of these two record sets, record ID sets, are the ones that are going to be that matched on this predicate and the other predicate. Right? And then now I take, I take those records that matched, go fetch them from, from the pages, right? Because I know where they exist because I got the record IDs and I convert the record IDs into page number and offset or file number, page number, offset, right? We saw, we saw how to do that before. Now I see how all these things are fitting together. I, I go get the, the records, then apply the other predicate, and then any tuple that matches that last predicate or the, the, this final predicate is then produced as my output for my operator. Right, the way Postgres does this, Postgres does this, um, it's called a bitmap scan, because these are actually bitmaps. So for every single tuple in my table, the bit will be set to one if, if, it, if it matches here. Right? I think in Oracle, they actually do sets, and they take the intersection of the sets. All right, so we covered how to do sequential scans, index scans, and, and multi-index scans. Right? That's the basic three access methods you have to, to read data. Is it, we basically, at this point, we, we now know how to run selects. But now we get data inside our database, and we've got to be able to modify it. Right? So with modification queries. So question. Yes? Do we build the index on the fly, or do we use an existing index? This question is, in this example here, am I building index on the fly, or am I using an existing one? Does not matter. Right? Again, the operator, like, so you would have, so in the case of, like, SQL Server, they would have a special operator called spooling index scan. And it knows to build the index on, on any tuple coming from, from its child, right? So you would have the, the index scan, and below that would be the sequential scan on the, on, the, on the data, on the tuple, right? But again, you can imagine, though, you could, you could do, assuming it gets the iterator model, you have the, the index scan, the spooling index generator, the, 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 the index creator, and then below that, the sequential scan. So you could sequential scan, feed tuples up to the... the, the, the the record, the, the operator then builds the index, and then that's a blocking call when you evoke that thing. Then now when you call uh, above that, basically the index thing is, okay, now I have my index, now I can start scanning and probing it, and produce output up above. And all the rest of the system, or the rest of the query plan, doesn't know that you created the index on the fly, it doesn't matter. You're, just, you're getting tuples. All right, so we're gonna talk about how we do inserts, ups, and deletes. Um, the other DMLs or the other modification queries you can do are uh, there's upsert, merge, and truncate. We don't really need to discuss those. Upserts are just basically I uh, check to see whether a tuple exists. If it does, I update it. If not, I insert it. 
right? It's, it's a sort of shortcut way of doing that. Truncate is basically deleting all the tuples. The way you implement that is just drop the table from the catalog and just re-add it. That's faster than doing a sequential scan and deleting it. Uh, and merge is basically a, a join and producing up. It's like, like an upsert. All right, so for insert, up, delete, the idea here is that those operator implementations, those operator uh, themselves in the system, they're responsible for actually modifying the, the whatever tables they want to modify and also updating the indexes, as well as checking any constraints that may be violated or that are placed upon the table to see whether the change you're about to make is, is allowed to happen. And then the output of these operators will either be the record IDs that got modified or inserted, or in some cases, if you care about the result of the, of the tuple you modified, like if you have a update query, you can pass this returning keyword at the end of it and say, update the, update the query, so update the tuples, or update the table, and also return me back the tuples that got modified in their modified form. But by default, I think you just get the number, number of things inserted, up, inserted, updated, or deleted. So for update and deletes, the idea is that there would be some lower operator in our, in our query plan that's responsible for finding the tuples we want to update or delete. And then now they're passing up those record IDs. And then those, those update delete operators are saying, OK, now I have the record ID. Let me go ahead and make the change that I want. So again, we have these composable query operators. Think about what your update query looks like. Update table set value equals true, where, then some predicate. That where some predicate, uh, that's just a scan, either index scan or, or sequential scan. That's just scanning down below, producing tuples uh, as part of its output that then feed into the update operator who, who then can apply the update. So you don't need to re-implement uh, the access methods to scan data in your update operator, because that, that would be redundant. And all the optimizations you'd have for you know, multi-index scan versus other kind of scans, you have to re-implement in all the, the update operators. Instead, you implement it once in your scan operators, and then that just feeds tuples up to the updates. One thing we are going to have to do, though, is also keep track of the tuples we've seen before, because now if, if we're doing a pool-based method, like the iterator model, where I'm calling get next, get next, get next, I may end up, uh, in my update operator, updating the index that then I'm scanning down below. So I may, like in, I may do an update uh, that changes the position of some tuple, and now I keep scanning. And now the, the scanning says, oh, now I found this, this another tuple, but it's the one you just, you just updated. We'll see the next slide, what, what, what happens here, what this is called. For inserts, there's two choices. One is you have the insert operator itself be responsible for materializing the, the tuple that then gets inserted into to the operator. This is what BusTub does. Uh, it's the most sort of simplistic way to do this. The second choice and the better choice is, just like before, where we have scan operators feeding tuples up into the update and delete operator, you have some lower operator that's going to be constructing the tuples or materializing them. And then now when you pass them into the insert operator, it just blindly takes whatever you're giving it. It has to check constraints, of course, but then it just inserts it into the table. So the second choice is better because this allows you to support select into, where you can take the, the select output and route it inside of a table. That's just another insert operator into a select query. Right? The select produces the output, and then it writes it into a, a table. Uh, and the insert operator can keep passing it up, so you see the result. And again, this, this, this interplay of composing things together is really neat. All right, so let's understand this update problem I mentioned before. So let's say we have a table on, of people, and then we have an index on salaries, or how much money people make, right? And it's the end of the year bonus or something, and we want, we want to bump up everyone's salary by $100 uh, if they make less than $1,100, right? So again, say I'm doing the iterator model and a pool-based method. So I'm going to start executing this thing uh, you know, for every single tuple in the child called you know, get next. This is now going to be an index scan operator. And this is going to do a, a probe into our, our index looking where the you know, salary is less than, than uh, 1,100. So again, since, this, since it's a B plus tree, these things are sorted based on, the, based on that salary. So assume I do my initial probe down to the leaf node. Now I'm going to iterate it. I'm going to scan across the leaf nodes and keep giving out tuples. Uh, that satisfy this predicate. So the say the first tuple you find is me, and I make, what do I make? $999 a year. Great, All right? So that then gets passed up as a return result for the emit operator here. And then the, the, for that given tuple, I'm going to go ahead and remove it from the index, right? Because we're, we're now changing the salary. 
and then I'm going to increase the increase my salary by 100 bucks. Now I make 10.99, and then the second part then inserts back into the index with that new value, and then I'm done for that iteration of the loop. Right? But now my index keeps scanning, and then lo and behold, it's going to find another matching record, uh, but it's going to be me again, right? Because I just inserted myself with a new salary. I'm scanning along, right? We're not talking transactions yet, but assume I'm just seeing any, anything that's in there. So now I see Andy at 1099 again, and I'm going to go back and uh, do the exact same thing I did before and bump my salary up again, right? Which is obviously incorrect, right? We want to update every salary only once. Who has heard of this problem before, out of curiosity, or is aware of this issue? So this is a very famous one in databases. It's called the Halloween problem. Uh, and this was, uh, this was discovered by IBM back in the 1970s when they were building, uh, building System R, was one of the first relational databases. Right? And so the basic anomaly here is that the, in our update operation, if it changes the physical location of the tuple, then as we're scanning along, we may see that same tuple again. Because say, I'm showing it in the context of index, but say I'm just scanning through pages as a sequential scan, I may see the tuple here, update it, and then it gets injected back or inserted back down to a, a smaller page, or sorry, a, a lower page, or a later page in that scan, and then I keep scanning, then I, then I find it. Right? So it has nothing to do with the Halloween, right? Uh, which Halloween is what, next week? Sorry. So the timing is always right to be able to talk about this, and it's, and it's actually the holiday uh, in the semester. It has nothing to do with Halloween, right? The, the, the researchers at IBM discovered this problem on a Friday on Halloween, and like, oh, this is a hard thing. How are we going to fix it? And they said, all right, well, it's Halloween. Let's go party, and we'll figure it out on Monday, right? And they just called it the Halloween party. And the, the, the Wikipedia article uh, mentions this. And I've talked to one of the people uh, that was at IBM at the time. They, like, yeah, they're like, they're like, oh, this is hard. Let's, let's worry about it later. Let, let, let's go drinking, right? So the solution, and this is what you would need to do for Project 3, is you just have to keep track of the, the, the records you've seen before like the logical records, not the physical records, because the physical location may change. Uh, keep track of the logical records you've seen before so that you don't try to update the same thing twice. Because it, you know, it, it should appear as everything, when you up, update your query, under like set semantics, or bag semantics, you should update everything in, in only once, apply one operation, even though physically you're kind of doing something in a linear fashion. Yes? The question is, uh, why don't, instead of, me from, instead of my for loop removing the index and then inserting it back in, why not update things first and then... Why, why insert immediately after removing if like, you only want to check everything once? The so question is, why insert everything immediately after removing it if we only want to update things once? Uh, so in this case here, the, in, the index is on salary, so I have to remove, my, I have to remove it, yeah. right? We're, we're going to do that. Now your question is, well, why insert this right away? Why not wait till... But again, always think in extremes. If they have a billion people at my company, then I have, to, I have to have an intermediate buffer for those one billion tuples to then I have to go later back and update. It's just not scalable. Yes? So based on this model, when updating a huge number of tuples, will there be some kind of crash in our index? The so question is, if, if we have a really large table with a billion tuples, would there be thrashing on the index? In terms of like pages getting evicted and you have to bring it back in? Yes. Absolutely, yes. It's unavoidable. And also, what about transactions when you abort? So he says, what about transactions when you abort? How do you roll that back? Give me two weeks. Yes. <laughs> uh, the answer is going to be basically you maintain a, a, an undo log. So you keep track of all the things you did so that in the case you do abort, you got you to know how to reverse that. So you basically would do, you would do the opposite of what you did here. Give me two weeks on that. I love trans transactions are, are super awesome. Uh, this is all awesome, but the transactions are, are a really wild way to think about things, especially in the context of databases. We'll come to exact, that exact problem later on. OK. All right, so the last thing I want to talk about is how we actually evaluate these predicates, which is we've been sort of hand waving about, oh, yeah, A equals 1, a, a, ID equals Andy. How are we actually doing this? So the database system is going to represent the, any predicate that's in a where clause or on clause or any, any, any projection, uh, like, you know, AID plus one as part of the output, 
it's going to represent those as, as initially as an expression tree. And the idea is that the, just like a sort of the query plan, there's a root, and we invoke that, and we traverse down, uh, in this case, we would go through a depth-first manner. Um, we traverse down and start producing uh, true falses for our predicate, we, or whatever the output needs to be for, for, for the expression tree. Uh, we could represent anything we, we, we potentially would want to do uh, in a database system. So the idea is that you would have these all these different expression types for all the various operators, the conjunctions and disjunctions, the, any arithmetic operators, uh, referencing tuples, making calls to functions. All these would be represented in nodes in this tree. So now, let's sort of a simple example here. So now when I want to run a query, I'm basically, for every single tuple, I'm going to evaluate that expression tree over and over again. So in this case here, so I, I didn't teach you about paired statements, but think of like, like, a, like a macro for a, for a query. I know I invoke this query over and over again. So instead of calling that you know, select star or whatever over and over again, I can say prepare my query with the name xxx, and then now I have this execute operator or execute SQL function or command that says, OK, I prepared, I prepared a statement up above called xxx. Now invoke it. And the, you can pass in now the function 991 in this example here, and that will get substituted where the dollar sign equals 1. Right? It's, it's like a simple macro thing. So now, say it, I, I'm gonna, I have a sequential scan operator. It's scanning table S, and now I've got to evaluate this, this predicate. So what's going to happen is I would define or convert this, this predicate as part of the parsing it in the SQL into actual the plan, or abstraction tree into a plan, and I would convert the expression into this tree like this. So again, you just traverse it in a, in a depth first manner. So you start it here at the equal sign, because that's the root, and then you traverse down to the left, and this is now a attribute uh, lookup uh, for the given, whatever tuple we're valuing it right now, uh, and we want the value of the, of the value column, a value attribute. So for every single tuple, I set up this context information and say, here's the, the, the parameter that was maybe passed in when I invoked the query, here's the table schema, so I know what the types are that I'm looking at, and then here's, any, uh, here's the, the current tuple that I'm, that I'm scanning through, that I'm looking at as, as I do my examination. So in this case here, you go look up in the execution context and say, OK, the current tuple uh, is you know, column 1, 2, 3. First column is 1, 2, 3, foul, uh, 1,000. So I look up in my table schema and it says, I know how to map s dot value into what offset of the column that I actually want. And then I get my, out, get my, my value like this. Now again, do a depth first search, go down the other side, same thing. I reach the leaf node here. Now it's referencing parameter dollar sign one. Do the same thing. Look up my execution context, and I want the first parameter. So I get now uh, nine nine one. Jump down to the other side. This one's the constant nine. Now I pass it up, and now I'm doing simple evaluation. Nine 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 one plus nine equals a thousand. That then bubbles up to the equal sign here, and then I compare it and see whether these values are true. If it's true, then I, I produce that as, as the result. So I'm doing this for every single tuple as in my table. That I got, I've essentially got to traverse this tree, which would be expensive. Right? It could be very slow. But this is how most systems are actually implement their expressions. For simple things like you know, value equals one thing, it's not that bad. But there's a lot of indirection again because I've got to know what the, the type of the, the expression node is looking at. I've got to know the type of the, of the values. And this can slow things down. All right, especially in a, in a modern CPU. I, again, we're not trying to optimize entirely for CPUs, but just be aware of like, the CPU wants things to be sequential. Having to follow down pointers in a tree is, is always going to be bad. So a better approach is this. We can just evaluate the expression directly. Right? My example here, you know, select star from table where s.val equals 1. So if I have a billion tuples, I don't want to have to reverse this tree over and over again to see whether the value I'm looking at equals 1. What I really want is just, almost as if you're writing code, a function, if you will, that just says, OK, check this expression, and just go you know, some value that I pass in, check to see equal equals 1. Because that you can do, in, in, you know, does something equal something, assuming they're two integers, that you can do in a, in a single instruction in the CPU. Like x86 will, will rip through that very, very quickly. ARM, everybody will. GPUs will. So to avoid all of this, what I could do is, I can maybe generate this code for the query as it shows up. Uh, and then now I basically have a, a code representation of the tree. Then I run that through GCC, Clang, LL, LLVM, whatever your favorite compiler is, ICC. And then now I have a machine code. Now I basically have a little function, compiled code, 
So now when I scan through my table and I look at every single tuple, I don't, run, I don't traverse that tree. I call the function. And that's going to be way faster. Yes? So what's the point of having these trees in general? This question is, what's the point of having these trees in general if I can just compile it? Well, one, not every system can compile it. right? That's pretty rare. Uh, two, you have to represent it as a tree anyway in order to then convert it into the, 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 the procedural form, an imperative form. right? You need, it, you need a tree representation first because additional optimization you can want to do. But some systems could, could generate this. We want to talk about this class. We talk about the advanced class. Some systems will actually co-gen the entire query plan, including all these predicates. Right? That's actually very, very rare. Very few systems do that. Some systems will actually could do this. Postgres can do this. And we can do a demo. All right. So uh, I have a really simple table. Um, I think it's called fake data. Right? Single value column, that's, that's a big end. So the first thing I'm going to do is uh, call PG Preborn. Uh -huh, sorry. Right. What PG Preborn does is basically fetch everything from, from disk and make sure that that's in our buffer pool. And I set, I set our system to have enough memory so that we, we could do this. Right. So my query is going to run uh, a really simple thing. It's select count star from fake data, where I'm just doing some, some bunch of arithmetic in the in the, in the where clause to see whether my tuple is going to match. So Postgres has what they call just-in-time compilation for where clauses. So let me turn that off first. Right? You set those off with this parameter. So now when I run this query, we see how long it takes uh, by itself without just-in-time compilation. Right? And it tells you the bottom it took, what, uh, 1.7 seconds? Um, right? So it spent uh, 0.2 mil yeah, milliseconds doing planning. And then 1.7 seconds doing ex execution. And again, this is the explain outputs. So you can see all of the, uh, the you know, that it ran in parallel, that it, it did all these loops and things, things like that. And then I'm producing the output of the buffers and telling it how, what percentage of the, of the, or how many pages were in the buffer pool that I got a hit on versus how to go get the disk. Because I pre, pre warmed everything, uh, everything is in, is in memory. That's good. So now let me, so it was 1.7 seconds. So now let me turn the JIT back on. And run that same query. And again, everything should already be in memory, so it wasn't an issue. All right? Uh, cut the keep going down. So now the query time went to 1.3 seconds. So we shaved 400 milliseconds. But you can see in here, uh, let, me, let me reduce the size, it's kind of jumbled. The font size. But you can see that it has the calculation about when it decided to, uh, to enable the just time compilation. Put it down to 14. Maybe that'll help. Yeah, it's a little better. OK, yeah, so let me run it again. So here you see that the planning time was just before, like 0 0.2 milliseconds. But now here's the JIT piece. And you can see that here's the time it spent to do it. Right? So the total amount of time was uh, to do the JIT piece was 200 milliseconds. So we got to win. Our, our, our query, we spent 200 milliseconds to save 400 milliseconds. So we, the query ran 600 milliseconds faster with JIT turned on. Because again, I don't have to traverse that tree for every single tuple as I'm looking at it. I just compile the function that does, you know, it does exactly what I wanted to do, and that runs much, much faster. So Postgres does this. Uh, and there's a bit of a cost calculation to decide, you know, is it worth, Postgres is going to try to decide how many tuples do I, do I need to look at, what's, how long do I expect to take to compile the, the, the predicate, the where clause, and is it worth doing that? So in this case here, because I had enough tuples, I think 50 million tuples, it was, it was better to compile it, spend time compiling, then run the query versus just running the query without the compilation. Make sense? Again, not every data system can do this. The alternative, and what Snowflake does, Snowflake doesn't do this just in time compilation. Snowflake pre compiles the functions ahead of time. And then it sort of stitches those, those, those functions based on what, what's in your predicate. Again, there's only so many data types you can have in, in SQL. 
So what you can do to say, okay, I'm gonna have a bunch of macros and I'll have comparing two integers, less than, greater than, equals, not equals. I pre-generate all those functions, I compile them, then at runtime, I now just invoke the function pointer to invoke that, 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 that function to do whatever the operation I need to do. And because they're running the vectorization model, not the iterator model, they amortize the overhead of making that function call because they're processing a thousand tuples at a time on a really tight kernel that can rip through a thousand tuples very quickly and using SIMD, which we'll cover in the next class, uh, and it, because everything is pre-compiled. Now, if it was the iterator model where I was making a function call for every single, every single tuple as I did my predicate evaluation, that would be terrible. I fully, I fully admit that. It would not be scalable. But because, again, the vectorization model takes a batch of tuples, that's why th that technique works. So most systems do not do what Postgres is doing here because there's additional complexity to the engineers to actually implement this. Databricks, and for Spark SQL, actually used to do something like this. They would, they would compile the whole query using the Scala compiler. And then they got rid of that because it became too difficult to maintain an engineer, and it's better off using the, 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 the Snowflake model, where you pre-compile things ahead of time and you stitch it together. I can talk a little about that, that, that next class, but Postgres does this, but it's, it's sort of it's very rare. As he was asking, like, you know, what if you, why doesn't I said, why even bother with the expression tree if you can just compile it? Most systems don't compile this. Yes. Is this, is this just a, pro, a better approach in terms of performance compared to the pre-compiled? Say it again. Was what? Sorry. In terms of performance, is this better than pre-compiled? So question is, in terms of performance, is this better than pre-compiled? Uh, we actually have a research paper that I wrote with the Germans and the people at CWI came out a few years ago. It's a wash. Sometimes the, the just-time just compilation is better, sometimes the pre-compiled is better, right? From an engineering perspective, the conventional wisdom is that pre-compiling is better. If you're doing OTP, if you're doing row store, you don't need any of this, right? Because there's going to be index lookups to find single tuples. You need this if you're doing analytics. You need something like this if you're doing uh, OLAP queries. Postgres is a row store system. It's not designed to do analytics. Somebody decided they added this a few years ago. Right? And again, it doesn't always help. In some cases, again, the compilation, if the compilation is expensive, it'll make your query run first, run worse. Right? If I see if I can do this. If I put a put a limit 10 here, right? Same query before, put a limit 10. Let's see what Postgres does. Um, uh, still, uh, still decided to compile it, which makes sense because it has to know. Actually, why did it compile it? It's kind of hard to read this query plan. So it's actually doing a parallel scan, but the limit, so you see, see, see the very top, the limit clause is at the top, right? Uh, I don't have an order by, I don't, so I don't know why they didn't push down the limit. Uh, I forget how to turn off parallel queries in Postgres. Um, it's like max workers. Let me see if I remember this. Max. And this is like there's different ways to control. Equals zero or one. Ah, I got it. Okay. So let's see, let's see what it does. Workers. All right. I maybe do zero. So this will do a non, hopefully a non-parallel scan. Now still did it. Workers plan. Workers launched. Partial aggregation. Uh, so look, yeah, st still compiled it. But if I do like, if I just keep it really simple. Uh, s select star from fake data. Limit one. So Postgres, in theory, should be smart enough to say, I don't need to compile this. And, and it doesn't, right? Because it says, all right, go get the first tuple. It's easy. All right. So again, it's trying to figure out what you actually want to do. What's the likelihood that it's going to have to read a lot of tuples? In this case here, right, they had the estimate say, uh, rows. Why do I have that? Uh, actually, here's a good example. So like. This is hard to read. Me. So Postgres, so this in, in Postgres query optimizer, 
this, this first thing here, this is the estimated cost of this operator. So Postgres estimated, I'm going to have to read 50,000 tuples, right, for whatever reason. Uh, but when you actually look at the actual results, it said, oh, I actually only read one tuple. So Postgres is off by several orders of magnitude of how, how many tuples it expected to execute here. Um, I suspect because didn't, I didn't run analyze when I inserted this. So if I analyze fake data, so if analyze is, a, is again a Postgres idiom, although it might be in the SQL standard, it's basically telling it, go collect statistics from, from this table now. And then now, in theory, nope. Well, now the number's different. Uh, Yeah, OK, so, all right, so here's what's going on. So again, Postgres is doing iterator model top to bottom. So the limit clause is on the top. Remember what I said before? So the limit clause, it knows it has a limit one. It expects to only execute one, right? And sure enough, it calls get next on the sequential scan once, gets back the result, and says, OK, I'm done. But the sequential scan operator knows nothing about the limit operator. So it just says, OK, I, know I have 50 million tuples. I expect to read 50 million tuples. That's what's going on there. All right, uh, I'm over time. All right, quick optimizations. You can do constant folding. They recognize that if I'm doing the same thing over and again, that's stupid, right? So if I'm coming upper clause on a constant, let me just run it once, use the constant over and over again. That makes things run faster. Another common sub, 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 sub expression elimination. If I see the same sub expression being invoked over and over again, again, I can just execute it, compute it once and reuse it, right? All right, so finish up. The, the same logical query plan, the same query, if you will, can be executed a bunch of different ways. There'll be trade-offs for, uh, for various systems, what the, what the data looks like, what the hardware looks like. Uh, and so the, the, you have to design the system with some expectation of what you think is actually going to come down the pipeline. Most systems, most data systems, most, especially in the OTP world, you can try to use as much in scans as possible and try to avoid sequential scans. But we saw a bunch of tricks we could do to avoid having to sequential scan everything if we could. The expression trees are flexible for us because they, we can represent anything, but they're going to be slow, and JIT compilation can sometimes speed things up if, if, if we're on the right situation. All right, so next class, we'll continue on with query execution, but now how to talk about how to do parallel query execution. So basically, how to take our query plan, and now instead of scanning a single, you know, one thread, scan a single table at a time, you know, one table at a time, scan in parallel. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith & Wesson One court and my thoughts hip-hop related Write a rhyme and my pen's intoxicated Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker Rhymes I create, rotate at a rate Too quick to duplicate, fill a breeze, have a skate Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight When I'm in flight Night, blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil. Records still turn with third degree burn for one man. I heat up your brain, give it a suntan. So just cool, let the temperature rise to cool it off with St. Ives.